What's up everybody, I'm Rick. And I'm Anna. And welcome to a review of The Trial of the Chicago 7. Come have fun with us and don't forget to subscribe. Released on September 25th, 2020, this Netflix film follows The Chicago 7, a group of anti-Vietnam War protesters charged with conspiracy in crossing state's line with the intention of inciting riots at the 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Uh, this is the first movie we watch uh, as part of this year's nominee for uh, Best Picture. New movies again! Yes, uh, modern movies. What were your thoughts about this movie? I have to say I loved how this movie made me feel so many different emotions while watching it. On one hand, it did get me quite angry because of, of the subject, but at the same time, the comedic parts were present there enough to get a chuckle, even in like the toughest moments in the movie. So I, I thought there was a Some comedic a good relief balance. there in the harshest moment. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah. And it was a great balance. You know, I feel like that is difficult to achieve. It's difficult to put comedic elements in movies that touch on such a difficult subject mm -hmm. without making it seem you know forced or unnatural but this movie did great i thought i also really enjoyed this movie i thought it was surprisingly for a movie you know that tells uh, a story that happened in the 60s surprisingly relevant to what's happening right now i wonder right? if and, maybe uh, well there is a reason why some uh, <laughs> okay things to say about that actually so it's kind of I guess for them a, a happy accident right because it makes the movie more relevant but it, it wasn't the intention right this movie was directed by Aaron Sorkin and Sorkin originally wrote the screenplay in 2007 with the intention of Steven Spielberg uh, being the director but after the 2007 writer strike in Hollywood uh, the movie kind of stayed in limbo for a while right until it was uh, resurrected by Spielberg much later uh, Spielberg dropped out as director and Sorkin was announced to be the director in 2018 so even back then in 2018 not that police brutality ever goes away but it wasn't at the forefront of the news or the media landscape right, right? the events of 2020 hadn't and happened so yet 2020 was kind of just it just so happens that things uh, that did match the movie happened in real life and Sorkin had a note about that uh, during an interview in regards to the film's uh, timely subject matter in 2020 he said the movie is more about modern days than it is about the 1960s now and the script didn't change to mirror the times the times changed to mirror the script which is an interesting way to see it right not that again police brutality ever went away but now it was what everyone was talking about and while I was watching the movie several times I was thinking wow nothing has changed huh? <laughs> yes yes I thought about that too I mm -hmm. thought about that too watching it especially I have to say with regards to alongside the um, Chicago 7 there is an eighth person yeah Bobby uh, Seale exactly mm -hmm. and he's a black man and the difference that the movie makes between you know the group of seven who are all white activists and the one black activist is striking you know it really makes you think like people of color are treated differently even amongst the people who are treated badly yeah right that's not something that actually went over the head of the rest of the seven right even though there was a mistrial and uh, Bobby Seale wasn't uh, with them until the end of the trial uh, they did use some of their uh, time at the end right when the judge asked them to talk about uh, and I'm talking about real life here what not the movie when the judge asked them to just you know if they have something to say they did use some of that time to talk about the injustice that black people were living uh, in the justice system here are some of the quotes Dellinger said whatever happens to us however unjustified will be slight compared to what has happened already to the Vietnamese people to the black people in this country and to the criminal with whom we are now spending our days in Cook Country Jail. Robin, another one of the seven defendants, offered a similar thought, saying, I'm glad we exposed the court system because in millions of courthouse across this country, blacks are getting shuttled from the street to the jail and nobody knows about it. And so that's a, a big element of this movie, right? The, the movie tackles a lot of tacky, touchy subject, right? Police brutality, uh, the war, but also racism, 
uh, also corruption inside the justice system. And I think it balanced all of those pretty well. I think so, yes. Although to me, it kind of felt like the main point of the movie itself was to show a justice system that doesn't work, mm. which then allows for all the other things to happen, like police brutality and discrimination against people yeah. of color and all of that. Because these are all elements of the justice system, right? The right. police are part of it, uh, the judge is part of it, the federal police, and FBI, judge, no. uh, the federal prosecutors, right? They're all in it together in a sense. And so it shows how broken the, the entire thing is. But now I think we're getting too yeah. much into <laughs> the, the subject matter and not enough about the movie, right. right? So let's get back to the movie here. First, I want to go over some of the production elements and the cast uh, of the movie. I said at the beginning that this is a Netflix movie. It wasn't intended to be. Originally planned for a theatrical release by Paramount Pictures, the distribution rights were sold to Netflix due to the COVID-19 pandemic because theaters are closed. So right. The movie was sitting there. They had to find a way to get it to people. But thanks to that, we were able to see it pretty easily. Uh, and see some of the actors who played in it, starting with Eddie Redmayne as Tom Hayden. So what did you think of him uh, and his performance, his character? I thought that his character was very interesting, particularly for the position that he takes. Well, first of all, I have to say, I thought the performance was outstanding. And yeah, the character was interesting because of the position that it was uh, put in. He felt like he was the main antagonist to the rest of the group. Even though they were all on the same side, in a way he had a very different point of view, which, uh, you know, it happens all the time. It's natural. For a lot but of it. You, you can definitely yeah. feel it. Like he, he is antagonizing the other yeah. ones for most of the movie. For a lot of it, it feels like he's out there to save his skin, right? Right. Like, I'll do whatever I need to to not go to jail. Uh, and then at the end, that, that, that kind of switches. And the switch I, I also wanted to mention feels very genuine. Like, you understand why it is at that point that he changed his mind. Mm -hmm. It's because when he's shown what is his way out, he realizes he doesn't want to take it. By the judge saying, exactly. like, oh, if you do this, yeah. then I'll remember it uh, during sentencing. Yeah. yeah. So in a way, if you contribute to all the bad things that are happening, you'll save your own skin. And he doesn't want that. Mm. Mufi also stars... Sasha Baron Cohen as Abby Hoffman. Sasha Baron Cohen was actually worried about having to do an American accent for the movie. What did you think of his accent, his performance? I think his accent was great. I mean, it sounds American. <laughs> as for his performance, because he is the one who like is being antagonized, right, by um, Eddie's character, he rises up to the to the challenge. I feel like these two actors paired together work so well in these mm. roles. Um, the back and forth dialogue between them is very like intense. He's made to be the likable one, right? Yes, uh, definitely. Because not only is he funny, a lot of the comedic relief that we were talking about falls on him. Sometimes quite literally, right? Because he's doing stand up, uh, telling the stories of right. what happened during the the riot, but. Uh, also, just by his general demeanor and yeah. the character. But the, the character doesn't end there, right? It would have been easy to have him be like that one-dimensional, like he's just the, the funny guy of right. the group. But then as the movie goes on, you realize he's also very smart, right? He's not just fooling around and it's like, oh yeah, revolution, man. No, like he has ideas and he has like justification for the things that he's doing, right? Right. As Tom says, he's the leader of these like hippies, yeah. um, you know, 60s hippies who are all about peace and flowers and not war. But really, he's so much more that he's about so much more than that. Mm -hmm. And he proves it amazingly when he takes the stand. Yeah. That uh, scene Which was is funny because just... you would think that's the last one of the seven you would yeah. want to take the stand, right? They had the more serious one, the, the older one, uh, who right. punched a, a cop. And then I guess that's why he couldn't take it. And the movie was made in a way that it felt like, oh, so you're the only one we have left, damn it. But but you have to, yeah. He did it uh, wonderfully, right? He did it wonderfully. Yeah. Like, the way he so nonchalantly gave all those answers, like a, like a nice like punch in the <laughs> face of the prosecution. Yeah. But like gracefully, you know? I'm concerned you have to think about it. 
Give me a moment, would you, friend? I've never been on trial for my thoughts before. It's just, I, I, I loved his performance, especially in that scene. Mm -hmm. Well, you're not the only one who loved this performance. Uh, he is actually nominated for Best Supporting Actor at the Academy Award. Uh, we don't have the results yet, <laughs> but uh, we shall see. Also starring in this movie is Yaya Abdul-Mateen II as Bobby Seale. Another standout performance, uh, in my opinion. Uh, you can feel throughout the movie like his very strong feelings, right? Of anger, sadness when his friend dies, like uh, outraged by the whole thing, right? And it makes you outraged also as you watch and you realize like they don't even let him have someone to defend him, right? Right, like I was mentioning in the beginning how the movie does a great job at showing the difference between him and the rest of the group, right? The other seven defendants, because while the judge, the court, everyone, you know, being there to judge them seems to have contempt for all of them equally, that contempt manifests differently. While to the seven uh, defendants, he shuts them down, he, you know, tries to counter all their arguments and all of that. To Bobby, he, they just don't let him talk. Mm -hmm. And throughout the movie, like, he isn't there for the whole movie, like towards the end, uh, he gets out of the picture. But while he's there, you can feel that he doesn't have a voice. Like, no matter how loud he screams, he just can't be heard. Yeah, and I thought the actor did a terrific job of showing that and yes. making you feel that for him because as you're watching, you're feeling it. You're getting angry with him, right? Yes. Mark Rylance also stars in this movie as William Kunstler, the defense counsel. I thought he was also a very interesting character in the sense that he starts the movie out by being someone who's like, yeah, I'm your attorney, I'm going to help you out. But right, I don't really believe that there's such a thing as a political... A trial and at the end of the movie he is on their side right, right. totally like from the beginning he is on their side but at first just as like that's his job yeah but as the movie progresses he gets more he and gets more, more outraged more, by this exactly story. and he gets more and more attached to their cause also yeah. which mm -hmm. i thought was was wonderful mm -hmm. i have to say i didn't think much of his character in the beginning but then there are a lot of moments when he tries to bring arguments you know, in the defense of, of his clients and when the judge keeps denying those arguments without cause, mm -hmm. you can see like how he gets sad and, and um, affected by the fact that he knows he's doing everything right, that their arguments should stand, but in front of this judge it doesn't it's matter. It's not working out yeah. right and so yeah. Disillusion exactly. is becoming more and more disillusion as the movie goes on. Movie also stars Joseph Gordon Levitt as Richard Schlotz. I thought when the movie started actually that he was the main character. I thought so too. I thought so too, and I was kind of disappointed that he didn't have more of a role because I thought his character was in a very interesting position. Because in the beginning, he was against what the protests were about, the protests as a whole, he, he says it himself. Mm -hmm. But he's not the kind of character who would have done shady Yeah, he's things. also he, against prosecuting them with no cause, Exactly. Right? And so when he's forced to do that, or not, I mean forced, he's, he's pushed to do that, mm -hmm. and he feels like he has no way out, I, it would have been interesting to explore that more, you know, like how did he feel Definitely. when he had to do all of these things when he knew they weren't right. And for someone, like you say, who knew it wasn't right, he sure does nothing to stop any of the very shady things that happens during the the trial, except the one time when Bobby gets gagged and right. then he's like, we have to stop that. And yeah. it kind of feels like it's more about now we can't use him. Right, exactly. Rather than for his own well-being, right? And I thought that was weird. Because I thought the way the character was first shown to us, when he's talking to his boss about the fact that this case is probably not winnable, right? Like, we don't have ground. I thought he would fight more for the fact that we're not supposed to be doing that, right? right. This, this is out of the uh, law, right? 
I think throughout the movie we see him throwing some sympathetic looks, but that's about the just the looks. Of it. Yeah. yeah, we show him sometimes, right? Yeah, he, he looks a bit sad about what he's doing, but does right. nothing about it. Yes, just at the end he stands up, and that that's it. But I mean, that's what would have been interesting, you know, mm. because while you can tell from his a little bit from his demeanor that he doesn't agree with it, he doesn't agree with what he himself is doing. He has to do it, and that would have been interesting to show, you know, like the yeah. the psychology be behind it. Mm -hmm. And real life, Richard Strauss was not ambivalent at all, oh. and uh, was uh, actually very, very much the, the bulldog of the prosecution. Another... Maybe that's why the movie didn't explore that more. Mm -hmm. And I also want to mention just there, like we don't have to talk about it uh, that much, but uh, Michael Keaton makes a surprise cameo appearance as uh, the ex Attorney General Ramsey Clark. When I saw him, I was like, oh, he's in this movie too. I'm surprised. <laughs> yeah. but, and I thought he was very good for the, what, 10 minutes he was there. Right. Mm -hmm. So as we were talking, right, I pointed out some uh, difference between the movie and the real life events. There are still a few more that I'd like to uh, talk about. All in all, the movie is pretty accurate, right? But of course, a lot of things are Hollywooded, right. if, that, if that's a word. <laughs> uh, we talked about Bobby Seale being gagged. In real life, Seale wasn't gagged and chained just for one session it was several days okay so they let it go on for several days yeah we also have a uh, rennie davison movie who's keeping a notebook of all the u.s soldiers who died since their trial started in real life uh, he was keeping a notebook of all the u.s soldiers but also all the vietnamese soldiers as well and i think that's very interesting uh, i wonder right. why they didn't put that in right yeah, that's interesting. I, I wonder how did he get the names, though? Mm, right? There was no internet back then, right? Yeah. Uh, harder, harder search. And then, finally, there was one question you asked me when the movie ended, right? When Tom Hayden uh, stands up and reads the names of every U.S. soldier who died, the almost 5,000 names. That uh, did not happen. He okay. did not read out the name uh, at the end of the trial. I, I mean, that would have been... Lengthy, I guess. I liked it for, you know, what it meant in the movie. But yeah, I, I didn't think that, that someone real. would stand up mm -hmm. and read 5,000 names mm -hmm. off our list. But like I said, they used their final words to talk about like the injustice uh, that they had uh, lived, but also in general, uh, black people had lived, Vietnamese people. I have to say, I, I don't think that that's necessarily an, an issue with the movie, right? I mean, sure, it's made to have that impact. That is the scene that made me cry when he starts reading the names. Mm -hmm. But I feel like, movie-wise, it sends across the message. And that's the point, mm -hmm. you know? Let's not forget that everything that we are watching here, this movie, is not about these people, it's not about the... Tro it's about, you know, the, the war and the cause and the, the people dying. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Which, when you say, like, what is the movie about... I think it's also very interesting that, of course, the movie is called The Trial of the Chicago 7, and so it's about the trial, and yet somehow I still expected to see more of the riots, mm. but we didn't, right? When the movie starts, and then you see them prepare to go to Chicago, and then we skip to them to the uh, trial, to the trial. Right. I was like, oh, wait, so we don't get to see the... And I think it's interesting that they weave it in. We see uh, some, like, in right? flashbacks. Or... Yeah, a little bit here and there, right? Yeah. But they don't really focus too much on showing us right. what happened. And I, I like that. I wasn't sure at first, but I, I like that in the end. I also like that they sliced in real uh, footage uh, throughout the movie. Yeah, that's, that's, that was very interesting. I like that too. Mm -hmm. I think not only artistically for the movie it works really well, but it also reinforces in the minds of the viewers that this actually happened. happened. Like, this is not a story. This is not like only Hollywood, you know, this mm -hmm. is history. Mm -hmm. At this point, Anna, I would usually talk about, right, uh, how well did the movie do uh, box office wise? There is no... No box office. <laughs> I mean, there is a little bit, but it's kind of a mood point, right, right with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So let's just uh, switch to uh, the critical reception, Academy Award wise. We don't know who's going to win those awards yet, but the nominations are out. So we can take a look at that. This film is nominated for six Academy Awards. Mm -hmm. So Best Picture, Best Supporting Actor for uh, Sasha Baron Cohen. We talked about it earlier. Best Original Screenplay for Aaron Sorkin. 
Best Cinematography for Fedon Papa Mitchell, Best Original Song, Hear My Voice, Music by Daniel Pemberton and Lyric by Celeste and Pemberton, and Best Film Editing for Alan Bocarten. So six nomination, right? Uh, what are your uh, prospects? What do you think it's going to get if it gets anything? Uh, I mean, it's so hard to tell, you know, because I haven't even watched the other mm -hmm. movies nominated. So normally I would say this is a great movie, you know, but I don't know what it's up against. So let's Best ask it like that then. What would you like it to win? Best Supporting Actor. For Sasha Baron Cohen. Yes, yeah. I think he deserves that. Again, I don't know what he's up against, but I think he deserves it. It was great. I mean, you reserve the option to change your mind as we yes, see more of these obviously. movies. Yes. <laughs> also film editing. Mm, yeah, I would go for I mean, editing. I thought for the... a movie that is not that... You know, it's not an action movie or something that requires a lot of, a lot cuts, of spe right? exactly mm. cast special effects stuff like this. Mm. It's beautifully done. Mm -hmm. Like it's cinematographic art in you know, in my opinion, and I think that would also deserve a win there. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely follow you there with the film editing, but we shall see yeah. uh, when the Academy Award uh, happened. Any final thoughts about the movie, Anna? Any things that we haven't talked about that you want to mention? Yes, there is one. Interesting scene. It's a very small scene, but I thought it sets an interesting tone in the movie. In the very beginning, when we see shots for the first time, waiting in in that waiting area to enter the the room of the attorney general, the secretary there tells him, "You are witnessing history," and he looks confused. And she says, "They're changing the the portrait mm -hmm. on the wall." It feels like it's directed towards us. Like you're witnessing history. This movie set in history you mm, know but also the the lack of awareness from the characters inside the movie right True. what exactly is the history that yeah, they're witnessing exactly so anna for every year of the academy award we rank the movie that are nominated for best picture right now we will be ranking the 93rd academy award movies the one from 2020 slash 2021 yeah the, there are a few from 2021 that there's, are and i think there's been one from 2019 the, oh. the whole thing is a bit uh okay but we'll call it 2020 can we call it the pandemic <laughs> the uh, pandemic years. <laughs> yeah and as of now we've only watched one movie from that list of nominees so for now it's going to be number one on our ranking at number one the trial of the chicago seven of course for those of you who don't know We've watched this movie as part of our bucket list goal to watch every movie that was nominated at the Academy Award from 1927 to 2028. This is the 108th movie we watched and usually we watch all the movies, right? Because we're making our way from 1927 to uh, today. But every year we do the movies from the current year right? or the previous year. Because we don't want to wait to yeah. have to watch these movies. <laughs> and so, yeah. Right now we're doing 2020 and then we'll go back to the 1940s. The next movie we will be watching is Mank. So if you want to follow along with us, I invite you to go watch the movie. Uh, I think it's also on Netflix. And then uh, come back whenever we do the review. And if you don't want to miss that review, subscribe to this channel. If you're not subscribed already, hit the notification bell to be notified whenever that video drops. Like this video if you did. Comment in the comment section below and tell us what did you think of the trial of the Chicago 7? Thank you for watching the video and don't forget that if you yourself have a goal or a dream that you also want to realize, take that first step.